Well, hiya, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. Wanted to come to you today with a book chat. I I recently finished two books for Nonfiction November, and so I wanted to do a book chat each of the next two days. Um, the first one that I had finished was Einstein, but I'm going to do, i got to get my book notes and stuff all put together. I'm going to do that one tomorrow. So this book chat is going to be about the book In the Heart of the Sea by Nathaniel Philbrick. It's the, the tragedy of the whale ship Essex. Uh, this was a awesome book. Um, I as I got to going through the book, and uh, you know, I got to I got to thinking about what are going to be my favorite books that I've read in 2020. And as I got to going through this book, this quickly started rising up the up the ladder. And it, I believe, I got to finish December, but I believe this will be one of my favorite books of 2020. It uh, it was just an awesome awesome story of um, the whale ship Essex. And, and I say awesome, it was a tragedy, just like the title says, but he does a fabulous job telling the story. And so um, a little bit about this book, let me, let me show that off to you. This is, this is a reprint, this is the movie version um, from In the Heart of the Sea, and I'm excited because I get to watch that movie tonight. My wife went and rented it from the library. Um, but this particular copy that I read was a penguin book, and it is 2015 is this edition. The original copyright was from, looks like 2000, and I have another copy of this that I had picked up that I uh, that I have at school. That's more of the original copy. But like I said, this is more the, the movie version with the with the picture and then it's got the movie credit stuff at the back but um, story was still the same in both books so uh, this book is 238 pages of text it's a total of 301 pages so it's a fairly small book um, it has some great maps on the on the inside here maps and and then Obviously, some pictures that would go with the story. Picture of the of the log there. The picture of the whale. Um, there's some more stuff there. Some drawings of the ships when it was attacked. Here's a picture of a jawbone of a whale. That was kind of cool. Um, picture of the island they get stranded on so it's got lots of lots of cool pictures and probably what was most helpful to me was a couple of the maps so as I'm reading this they've got a couple of maps that take you on the journey with them and I really uh, appreciated that because I was able to kind of go back and get the visual of where they're at in the in the uh, in the story and so uh, Nathaniel Philbrick like I said just did an awesome, awesome job in this book, and um, I was telling, I was telling uh, a friend about this book. I, I went when I finished it yesterday because we had it, and I finished it in SSR at school. And I took the copy over to a t another teacher friend. I said, "You got to read this, man. This is like awesome. It's the the best adventure story that uh, I've read in a long time." And and actually, I said that to him a couple days ago. And uh, yesterday when I finished it, there was a quote at the end that kind of made me think twice about what I had told him. Um, and it was, the Essex disaster is not a tale of adventure. It is a tragedy that happens to be one of the greatest true stories ever told. And that right there, I, I love that quote from the book. It comes from page 236. I love that quote from the book because that kind of tells the whole story. Um, you know, it, it is a bit of an adventure to an extent, but he says it's not. It's a tragedy, and it's the best true story uh, ever told. And that's exactly what Nathaniel Philbrick did. He took a true story, he took nonfiction, and he made it feel like a fictional adventure. And he, he just did an awesome job with it. Uh, I truly appreciate it. This is not a area of my expertise. It's not something I read about. Uh, a lot. I think I've probably read three, maybe four books in my life about uh, adventures on the ocean in one way or another, whether it's a biography or something like this. And so um, I was real excited about this. 
And so let me tell you a little bit about the book. Uh, so he begins, Nathaniel Philbrick begins the uh, discussion on the island of Nantucket. And the whale ship Essex is loading up and getting ready for a trip out into the Pacific you know, around the, around the uh, around South America, out into the Pacific, and they're going to go whaling. And um, usually, these journeys last between two and three years. And uh, so, these guys that are working on these whale ships, they really commit a large part of their life to uh, their their jobs. And what what he starts out the book with is talking about the island of Nantucket, and he really does a very nice job of explaining the the social dynamics on the island. Uh, you know, so he talks about um, the lives of the men, the women. He talks about uh, religion. A lot of them were Quakers and how that how that plays into the whole um, social dynamics. He talks about the, the um, economic status of everybody from the rich to the poor. And he does a really good job of letting you see uh, what it was like to be on a whale ship, you know, throughout the story. Uh, from the eyes of not only the captain, but really from the the average Joe who's you know on the bottom end of the rung working on this whale ship doing the you know the nastiest of jobs, and so I really appreciated the description that he gives while he is um, going through this. Uh, let's see here. He oh he goes into you know what, what what I really liked is he's got some diagrams of the ship and like where you would have everything in the ship as far as the storage capacity where men slept all that kind of stuff and I really liked that he had some diagrams in there that showed that and he fully explained everything and he explained uh, you know what you would need on these trips as far as food and clothing and and that type of stuff and he also talked about the stopovers that these ships would have on different islands to resupply and the dangers of this job. And so he really does a nice job of making you feel like you're getting ready for the trip. You're going to go on the, uh, you know, this whaling adventure with them. Uh, let's see here. Uh, he goes through and he talks about the whale ship Essex. When it finally takes off, it goes out into the Atlantic and makes the big round trip towards you know towards Europe and Africa because of the you know the direction of the winds and the ocean currents and stuff and they have to make stopovers at the Azores and the Cape Verde Islands and uh, along the way right off the get-go the Essex hits a, a squall out in the ocean and a really bad storm and the boat gets really rocked they almost considered turning back and going and uh, fixing the boat and they decide not to. They end up stopping in the islands, resupplying. They fix a couple things on the boat. This boat's an older boat, a little bit rickety. And uh, the worst part of when they hit the squall is they they were short whale boats. And um, that becomes a big issue later in the story uh, where they, nev they, they have troubles finding replacement whale boats. And they're going to try on the islands to find some replacements. And... They, they find one, but it is not much of a replacement, as we'll see. Um, so he ends up, they end up uh, circling back towards South America so they can go around the tip of South America. They end up getting their first whale sighting. Um, they had quite an adventure when they went out to hunt the whales. Uh, the very first time they, uh, they went out there, and you have to understand, a lot of these guys, they can't swim. You know, that to me makes no sense in my modern mind. Why would you be out on a out on the middle of the ocean and you can't swim? Well, a lot of these guys couldn't swim. Well, they would get in these whale boats. So you'd have the big the big ship and then you'd have smaller whale boats that would actually go out to kill the whales. And um, they went out to kill this whale. And while they were getting ready to harpoon one, a second one came up from underneath the boat and flipped their boat. And so you can imagine how scary that would be out on the open ocean and you can't swim and your boat gets flipped and so they have a lot of these little misadventures along the way so as they get going into their trip deeper into their trip they finally come across their first whales and uh, they 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 kill a whale and Philbrick does an excellent job of describing what it was actually like to once you you know harpoon the whale, what all you had to do to that whale to you know strip it of its resources, the resources that these guys were wanting, 
and you know he he got down into the nitty gritty on the detail of this and talked about you know cutting into the shark and then ripping strips of its hide and fat and everything off of it and then uh, you know towards the end when they're uh, looking to get the oil from these sperm whales they they like I mean it was pretty brutal they smashed a hole in its head because the the front one-third of the of the whale is all head but inside of that head is a storage area where all of the uh, the best oil is and um, you know they they talked about splitting the head open and then they would actually have a guy crawl down into the whale's head and scoop out all of the the um, uh, the, the, the whale oil and they would get bucket loads of this stuff, just tons and tons of this stuff out of the head. And then when they were finished with that, they would take those strips of hide that they had ripped off of the entire whale. And they would have to do some type of uh, cooking, processing right there on the ship. And they said it was absolutely disgusting and smelly. And I mean, they talked about, he went into the detail on, you could always tell a rookie from, from a veteran and uh, the rookies, you know, this was a several day process. They would change their clothes every day. And then by the end of the first whale, they would be out of clothes and they would have to buy clothes from somebody and put themselves in debt. And the, the veterans knew better and they would wear those same clothes throughout the whole process because their clothes were going to reek to high heaven. They were going to stink, stink, stink and be ruined. So anyway, he goes into all those details. And what I really like about it is um, he gives you the nitty gritty, but it's not necessarily terribly gory. Um, there's only probably one incident where it gets a little bit gory. And I thought it was, uh, it, it made me uh, kind of, I mean, like, ooh, you know, one of those moments. Uh, and that was yesterday. And I'll, I'll read that to you here in a minute. It, it was pretty interesting. But he gives you the detail without necessarily giving you the... Um, Oh, the sensationalism, I guess is maybe one way of putting it. And so I like that because it makes me feel like I am on the journey with him in the whale ship. I am one of the guys on the, on the, uh, on the, the, the trip. And so uh, anyway, he gets to going. He talks about, uh, he does a, a great job of talking about when the boat goes up the coast of western South America, it heads up towards the uh, Galapagos Islands. And along the way, they find... Um, small town where some of these uh, whale ships had came in and they had been stuck out at sea for a long, long time because the new whaling grounds are like several thousand, a couple thousand miles off the coast. And when you're out there in the middle of the Pacific, you are really out in the middle of nowhere. And if you don't have food, you're in trouble. And some of these whale ships have come back to the, to the uh, small villages and they are suffering from scurvy and they're near death. They're like walking skeletons. And so these guys that are on the trip are actually seeing this. They're seeing the evidence of what could happen. It was almost like giving a premonition of what was to come. And so you get to the Galapagos Islands and they're getting ready to make sure they get plenty of food for that trip so that doesn't happen to them. So uh, they, they landed at one of the islands and right off the top of my head, I can't remember the name of the island, but, um, the men were sent out to the island to walk the island, and they're picking up the tortoise, uh, the, the turtles, and they were bringing those turtles back to the ship, and uh, they were talking about just the pure weight of these, I mean, like 400-pound turtles, plus, uh, you know, and they got even heavier than that. Some of them took six guys to lift, and so they would put these turtles on, on deck on the ship, and they would let them just roam the deck, and th those turtles, they didn't have to feed them. And those turtles, I think he said they would last a whole year without ever really having to feed them. And they would be a food source for them when they're way out in the middle of the Pacific. And so they become vitally important to uh, their survival. And um, so that's going to play big later in the story. On, the, on that island in the Galapagos, while they were out looking towards the end, one of the guys was being uh, a dingus. And, um, you know, they, they were in the middle of the dry season and this island is like literally pretty much brown because it's so dry, he dropped a match. He was messing around, flicked a match, set the entire island on fire. And even to this day, that island has not, you know, and this, was, this took place in 1820, 1819, 1820, that, that uh, time frame. And uh, even to this day, that the island, 100, no, 200 years, excuse me, 200 years later, it has not recovered. 
And so um, permanent ecological damage to um, this island. Kind of a sad deal. The captain is pretty irate. Um, and he, you know, he talks about that and what, what harm these sailors did out in the islands in the Pacific as they, as, you know, different boats stopped at different islands, what they ended up doing to the ecology of the, of the, uh, island. So anyway, uh, they get out into the ocean and, uh, as they are hunting a couple of whales, one of the sperm whales gets angry and, uh, you know, Philbrick kind of tries to guess maybe what happened. Maybe it got angry for some reason, or maybe uh, when the men were tacking something on the ship, those sounds, uh, you know, uh, vibrated through the water or whatever, and the whale heard it, and for whatever reason, it, it attacked the ship. So anyway, uh, this whale hits the ship, hits it twice, and ends up pretty much busting the ship up. It starts to sink, and by time the two whale boats that were out out in the you know out hunting the other whales by the time they get back um, the ship is going down and so they're quickly trying to pull out all the stuff and and uh, or all the stuff that they can um, they can get out of the ship before it gets ruined and sinks so they get a little bit of hard tack which is like a, a hard hard cracker you know it's their bread um, not very good uh, but but it's what they've got. That's what they're able to save was a little bit of hardtack, and they got some of those turtles. And so they are stuck now uh, over a thousand miles out in the out in the ocean. I, I can't remember exactly how far out. I know it's over a thousand. It's way out there, and they are stuck out in the ocean trying to figure out what to do. And so they decided, uh, you know, they had some choices. There were some islands to the west that they could possibly hit, which. In the end, we find out that's probably what their best bet would have been, but uh, they were scared of cannibals. And this, this gets into what is the actual knowledge of the sailors in this area of the Pacific. And they didn't know where they, they didn't know much about the area. And so um, if they would have sailed to the west, they probably would have been just fine. But they were scared of cannibalism uh, by the, the natives. And so they ended up heading east towards South America. And... Um, as they're going, they face starvation issues. Their 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 food supplies get lower and lower. They butcher the turtles, uh, you know, and it gets lower and lower. They finally land on an island, and uh, of course, they do permanent damage to this island. They eat up every food source there is on this small island, and then they have a decision to make: Do we stay on this island and hope for a ship, or do we try to go back? And most of them wanted to try to go back. Three of the men stayed behind on that island and would later be saved. And uh, they go through the detail of now, as they get out to the ocean again, they got a little bit of food supply from the island, what, what they could. And of course, like I said, that's going to be totally decimated as far as the ecology of that island. It's going to be totally decimated with the, with the animals that are there because they're going to eat them all. Uh, they head... Uh, east toward the boats head east toward South America and as they get to going uh, they kind of get tossed back and forth you know because they they have troubles at times figuring out exactly where they're at uh, as far as uh, longitude goes and as they get out there they they're stuck out there for a long long time I think it was like was it 93 days or something like that like three months basically out on the ocean uh, total and uh, they face the issue of, well, one of the guys dies. One of the guys uh, dies that was at, in the ship. What do we do with the body? And uh, eventually, as this starts to happen more often, um, they make the decision to partake in the body. And, um, you know, the, the dead are going to save the living. And so cannibalism takes place. And... Uh, the great thing about Nathaniel Philbrick is, you know, he talks about it, but he does not sensationalize. Um, he doesn't get, like, gruesome and gory. I mean, you get the point pretty quick, and um, I, I appreciate that about him because it's a story that doesn't necessarily need to be um, played up. It, it plays itself up. And um, so anyway, he does a good job explaining that, though, and um, I, I really appreciate that. And then when they, they made... Uh, they end up having to draw straws at one point, and who's gonna who's going to be killed to 
allow the others to live. And he talks about that. And what I really like is the history that Nathaniel Philbrick goes through in you know sailing history as far as cannibalism. I, I thought that was very interesting. Like where do we first see the reports and where does it, uh, does it, is it always taboo? Does it become something that's regular? That kind of stuff. And he goes through the whole history of that. And I thought he did a really nice job of explaining that and fitting it into the story. Um, so between his detail of harvesting the, you know, harvesting the, the whales out on the ocean, the issues of starvation, um, the getting into the cannibalism area. I just thought his detail in this was really, really good. Um, and, and the story is very fast paced. He takes you on this journey and, um, you know, he could have probably wrote a really big, thick book on this, but he chose to make it short and sweet and to the point. And I appreciated that in this book. Some books need to be thicker, but this one is, um, I think just about the right length. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, anyway, these ships, the, the, the boats, they end up getting saved, but before they could be saved, there's, like I said, quite a bit of cannibalism that happens uh, with men dying just from simple starvation. And um, let's see here. Uh, oh, what was really interesting um, is he also ties in, because this is like the, basically the true story of Moby Dick. This is where uh, Herman Melville gets his ideas for his story, Moby Dick. And so he ties, throughout the entire story, he ties that, that thread in the story and explains how Melville worked it into his book. And I thought that was really interesting. It's, it's interesting enough that I want to pick up that story and read it. I want to read Moby Dick. And that might be something I maybe try to tackle this summer or this, you know, this next summer, 2021. So uh, the, the last thing that he does in the epilogue was really interesting. It's talking about Nantucket today and how whaling is basically non-existent in Nantucket today and how they rely on tourism. And they were talking about in a museum that they built that they put this whale in, uh, they wanted it to center around whaling and they wanted a big whale skeleton. Now, what I wanted to read to you, let me find the page number here. Okay. Um, was this interesting. I was in SSR yesterday with my kids and I read this <coughs> and they, um, on Nantucket, and this is in modern times, they had a whale, uh, wash up on shore and eventually this whale ended up dying on the beach. And so they wanted to harvest the whale so that you could, you know, take that skeleton and put it in the museum. And so, uh, I thought this was really interesting. Uh, and this was very, this was probably the point where he got the most descriptive, um, and it says, as one group worked at the whale's midsection, a New England aquarium staff member climbed up on top of the whale. And with a long-handled Japanese flensing tool, he made an experimental six-foot slice into the intestinal cavity, unleashing a gaseous explosion of gore that blew him off the whale and drenched the others in blood. And for the next few minutes, rope-like intestines continued to bubble out of the incision. Even though the whale had been dead for several days, the outdoor temperature was well below freezing. The blubber encased in the body steamed in the cold January air. And uh, I was reading that yesterday in class. I was like, whoa, you know, you, you, know, you popped that whale and blew him clear off the ship. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, maybe, that's, maybe that's the, uh, the, the, the goriest this book probably was. Um, and I just, I don't know why I found it interesting. I just thought I'd share. But uh, he does a good job with detail. And then he, you know, he works in how they got that skeleton into the museum. And now it's a centerpiece in the museum and the tourism trade. And so whaling has come full circle in Nantucket. And I thought that was a nice way to kind of wrap the whole story back together. For me, this is a five-star read. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was great. Uh, most likely going to end up on my top books in 2020 that I've read. I love this story. It's good. I'll probably read it again someday. Um, so it's got lots of detail. I like that. I mentioned that. It's got uh, the detail, but not the gore necessarily. Um, it's great writing, fast paced. It's a page turner. Uh, I thought he did a really good job uh, with the research. It's well researched. Uh, makes me want to read Moby Dick uh, and further that exploring the, you know, the whaling industry. 
Uh, I'd highly recommend this book. Thought it was great. And um, yeah, I hope this review helps some of you out there. Uh, he does a, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention before I forget. Um, he does a great job of explaining the science side of stuff with this story. Um, you know, when he starts talking about starvation, he starts talking about uh, different um, studies that they've done to show what happens to the human body when it gets into starvation mode and stuff like that. And they've and he does a good job of comparing it to real life situations and scenarios. And so um, that was part of that research side that I really, really enjoyed. He he made this a very approachable book. And so anyway, BookTube, um, I'm rambling now. I probably need to wrap this up. I hope you enjoyed this review. Um, I hope you go check this book out. It's very, very well worth it. Please go read this. Five-star read for me. Thank you for watching, and I uh, hope everyone has a great day and stays healthy. And as always, happy reading.